All right, welcome back to Legal Cut Pro. We are at the Clio Cloud Conference in San Diego, beautiful San Diego at the Grand Manchester Grand Hyatt, excuse me. And I am here with Eric Goldman. Uh, Eric is a professor of law at Santa Clara University School of Law. He also co-directs the school's High Tech Law Institute and supervises the school's privacy law certificate. Eric teaches and publishes in the areas of internet law, intellectual property, and advertising and marketing law. He also blogs on these topics at the Technology and Marketing Law blog, which has been inducted into the ABA Journal's Blog Hall of Fame. The California State Bar's IP section has named him as an IP vanguard, and Managing IP Magazine twice named him to a short list of IP thought leaders in North America. Eric, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. That's quite. Uh, those are quite the credentials. I'm uh, super honored that you can join me here in uh, um, on the poolside. I wish your <laughs> listeners could enjoy the weather we're enjoying right now. Yeah, we are outside poolside doing this interview, and it, uh, it was just amazing scenery here. But we have some business to do. So uh, again, welcome. And one thing I read in your bio, underneath that, was that you had you got your first email address in 1991. Yes. How how did you get an email in 1991? I, I remember I got an e I had an email address, but it was not an internet one. I think maybe early 90s and on the uh, the BBS systems or something like that. <laughs> You're dating yourself, sir. <laughs> oh yes, I am. <laughs> so how how did you manage to get an email in 1991? I started grad school in 1990. The first year mm -hmm. I spent in the law school, and we didn't have email addresses in law school at the time. Um, in fact, there were really almost no network computers. The only network computers were the uh, Lexus and West Law terminals. You had to go in the basement to go access. Um, but I was doing a JD MBA program, and in 1991, I started the MBA portion of the program, uh, and it was standard issue uh, for all new MBA students at the time. Oh, well, excellent. And what, I'm just curious, what was your first reaction to, to sending and receiving that, those first emails? I had used um, computers, even network computers, in my um, post-undergrad, pre-grad school work. Yeah. We had used, for example, systems to be able to communicate with our Orange County office from LA um, over uh, what was basically um, text messaging um, or you know, uh, instant messaging. But I'd never had the ability to reach out to all my classmates or my entire community all at once and I was just enthralled it's it's what I'd always wanted and I never even really knew that such a thing could solve my problem right so when I got my first email uh, address I was addicted I realized this is something really important to me well that's fantastic I remember the first emails I sent that were long distance so to speak on the, the BBS systems and I'm not sure even if it was called email back then uh, on the BBS systems but I remember I was amazed that it took only two days for me to send and then receive back a message from Australia yeah. <laughs> over email. And I was like, wow, that is amazing. Rocket docket there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we're not here to talk about emails, but I want to talk to you because you are an expert in emojis and the law. I do love emojis and I do love the law and I love the combination. And you are here at ClioCon to give a talk on emojis at the, That's and correct. the law. And I look forward to that talk. Is this your uh, first ClioCon, Eric? It is. All right. And, uh, oh yeah, you just got in, so you haven't had a chance to explore too much. Yeah, no, yet. but I'll hit the um, exhibits later. Again, something your listeners can't do, and I'm going to pick up a lot of squeezy toys. <laughs> Fantastic. And the reason why I want to uh, interview you on this podcast is because, as I mentioned off-pod, is that I practice entertainment law, so I serve film and television producers. And one of the issues, or one of the areas that I assist producers in is called clearances. Mm -hmm. right? And that's for clearing for issues and relevant to this interview is copyright, trademarks, and also other issues like defamation, privacy, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the uh, issues that came up was surrounding emojis. You know, uh, the script said that the kid was texting, is either texting on, on a computer and they were sending emojis. And are there, the question came up, are there copyright issues mm -hmm. or, or other IP issues with emojis and do we need to clear these emojis? So, and I've read your uh, five-page abstract, it's on SSRN entitled Emojis and Intellectual Property Law, who you co-authored with uh, Gabriella Ziccarelli, is mm -hmm. that correct? That's correct. Yeah, and a um, great paper, by the way. Oh, thank you. And uh, that helped uh, give me background on, you know, emojis and, and the law and then some of the IP considerations. So, can, can you uh, just uh, explain um, for, the listeners uh, and keeping in mind that they're the television producers is that 
What, what, what's some of the, the copyright considerations in emojis? Let's start with a counterintuitive conclusion mm -hmm. that an individual emoji is often capable of being protected by copyright law. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, here in the United States, we have hundreds, if not thousands, of individual emoji depictions that have been actually registered with the Copyright Office. I'm sorry, I don't know about Canada, if there's such a, a similar uh, type of phenomenon. My guess is that there would be. So, uh, so you start with that foundation, that if individual emoji depictions are copyrightable, well, there's lots of consequences. It means even showing a single emoji in a film would potentially raise a clearance issue. You'd have to say, what's the provenance of that particular emoji? Um, is it eligible for copyright protection in the first instance? If so, who would be the copyright owner of it? And do we have any defenses that we're willing to rely upon as part of making this uh, film? The overwhelming mushroom of clearance issues that can arise if somebody wanted to make an emoji emoji-related film uh, should really be quite overwhelming. And I don't have any good news about that. That's kind of <laughs> standard practice for guys like you. It's how you make your money, in fact, is, you know, the more complicated it is clearing the movies, the better. Um, I would add that in addition to individual emojis being depicted, it's possible to have a copyright in emoji sets. So right, you yeah. can have a set of emojis that are uh, all thematically related with perhaps a particular style, and the, there might be a copyright in the set in addition to each individual emoji. So there's now two different layers of copyright review that might be required in order to, uh, to clear a, um, an emoji for a movie. And in the paper, you also mentioned house style emojis. Can you explain what those well, the house style might be the way in which the the emoji set is mm -hmm. created. So, for example, uh, Google for a long time has used what I might call a half moon type depiction of its emojis rather than a circular emoji. Um, and that represents their house style that throughout all the different emojis they depict, they adopt this particular convention and then uh, reflect it in the, um, the individual uh, emoji. So, so the house style might be part of why the emoji set is copyrightable in addition to yeah. each individual individual emoji. Uh, the house style might also be the thing that could create a trade dress argument. I think those are a little bit more difficult to argue. You've got some questions about whether or not there's use in commerce in the first instance. But uh, the house style could also be helping create a trade dress in addition to uh, copyright and uh, the set. And just for, I should have uh, asked you about this before um, uh, launching it right into the questions of copyright consideration, but just defining emojis. So emojis are they're graphical depictions of uh, Unicode instructions. Is that, is that uh, fair to say? Well, there are a lot of different flavors of emoji, mm -hmm. and that's part of the nomenclature challenge, mm -hmm. is to make sure we've been talking about the right thing. Um, right. So, for example, there's a standardized set of emojis, the Unicode emojis, yep. where uh, Unicode assigns a unique number, a, an outline or a glyph, right. yep. a short description uh, of a particular emoji. Um, and uh, then each platform that adopts the Unicode standard can depict that particular glyph however they choose. Um, they're not required to be faithful to right. the glyph at all. So that's one of the reasons why we were talking about who owns the, the copyright. You've got this question, well, are the uh, platform depictions of emojis a derivative work of the Unicode outline? Or are they their own independent work? Or are they yet some other third thing? There are other kinds of emojis, though. So, for example, there's the um, uh, proprietary emojis that each site can develop that are not designed to conform to the Unicode standards. They don't interoperate at all across the network. Um, they only work within the system. Mm -hmm. uh, things like Twitch emotes are a good example about that. They work on Twitch. They probably don't work anywhere else. And so those are also potential eligible for copyright protection. Those are pretty clear, then, who would own them, whoever designed them for the, for the particular um, uh, for the particular uh, platform would own them. And then you could have uh, things like emoji sets that are custom created, like the Kimoji. I don't know if you're into that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I, I really am not. <laughs> yeah. uh, but not. Not into it, but I, I know of it. Yeah. Okay, uh, so you know, you can have these, these things that are overlaid on top of the network. They're really just graphical images mm -hmm. that only work if your recipient can receive the graphical That's images right. or have the appropriate software to uh, read them. And then there's things like the Animojis or the Memojis or the uh, uh, AR uh, emojis. Um, these are all basically small films that are con customized to have some relationship to how we think about emojis. And again, those are proprietary. Those are also right. going to be within the scope of a uh, particular platform. So to answer the broad question about who owns an emoji or if it's copyright protected, we have to actually even taxonomize in the first instance. And then once we taxonomize, then we can start to trace who might be the owner of it. Just wondering, on, on that uh, note with uh, copyright ownership, 
of uh, an emoji, assuming that it does qualify as, as a copyrighted work for a particular emoji or set of emojis, there is, I, I, I guess arguably, and I, I don't know if you've written about this, but a, a license, of course, for the user to, to use it, you know, on the, that particular depiction of the emoji on their platform. I'm wondering how far would that license go? Uh, I think that for the purposes of film production, it might not so, go so far as, yes, you can depict it in this film, you know, without any conditions or anything like that. But would that kind of license to use mainly be for personal use, sending, receiving, uh, posting on social media, you know, as a, a license to use for the user, would that be fair to say that that's maybe around the scope of uh, the use? I haven't gone and researched how the different mm -hmm. platforms describe emojis in their overall licenses that they grant to their users. Okay. Um, it's not always clear to me that every platform would even address the emojis That's in right. it. They might, they might simply be silent about it. Um, I think it would be disingenuous for a service to offer an emoji pack and then to sue people who use it for its yeah. ordinary function. I, I don't think that's logical, but if we are relying on something like an implied license, because it's not expressly mm -hmm. stated in the scope of the license, um, we do have that, uh, that very pregnant question. Um, how far can we push that implied license yeah. before we ex exceed it? Uh, if I were a filmmaker, another option would be to look for the open sourced emoji sets um, mm -hmm. that could uh, be potentially licensed for use in film, uh, maybe without even royalty. Um, so it could be simply that they said these sets are open for everyone to use and then you can include them without having to worry about um, who might uh, be objecting. The problem is that those open source ones are often aren't as pretty as the That's other it. ones. And so you, what you want is the good looking ones, but with no license. And that may require you to make a choice. And, you know, with, with that, it's like sometimes it's hard to find. And you're right, a lot of times it's silent on what, what's the extent of this license, right? And it's, it's be hard to argue that implied license covers depiction and use in a, a film production, or, or maybe not. I don't know. But in the end... Uh, I, I should uh, be asking you that question. <laughs> Would you green light that? <laughs> I'll have to reserve <laughs> my opinion. Um, but, and sometimes the advice would be, uh, as in with other, uh, you know, copyrighted materials, that if we cannot get the release from the owner and there is any chance of a claim, then we get our art department to create their own, mm -hmm. you know, like, and maybe create our own emojis. Mm -hmm. and, but, and then sometimes, that, that's sometimes difficult as well, because uh, like an artist creating the emoji for you would be inspired by something they saw. And, you know, you don't want to get too close to... The, the original work, right? And, and we'll talk about that in today's yeah. session. It's really yeah. a core concept about emojis is that the Unicode standardization is actually a failed standard because mm -hmm everyone depicts them a little bit differently. And possibly for the reason that they're worried that if they depict it identically to some other platform's right. depiction, they're gonna be stepping on their copyright toes. So right. we see this uh, proliferation of immaterial variations in emoji depictions precisely for the reasons you described. So it would be, I think, very possible for an art department to create an emoji that looks similar to, but different than every other present. And the fact it looks similar to may not be held against them because all of them look similar. That's by design. They're all riffing off the same underlying yeah. glyph that the Unicode provided. Um, so you, you, that's actually, you could work around that with the art department. Um, it also seems like this would be an opportunity for a branded deal kind of thing where could you be. could work with a platform that says, hey, we're going to be featuring you in this uh, platform. Give us a license to your emojis. And oh, by the way, maybe a little cash consideration for all that brand uh, love that we're about to give you. Perhaps, yeah. Uh, I want to go back to a, a term that you mentioned, use in commerce, you know, mm -hmm. uh, trademarks. Mm -hmm. right? So there are, of course, in your paper that you wrote about trademark considerations mm -hmm. and that uh, emojis have, there are numerous uh, trademark applications and registrations in the USPTO and as well, I think, in the, in the Canadian Register. I apologize. I haven't checked, but I would be shocked if there weren't. Yes. Uh, I, I think there, last night I checked that. There, there are some. I don't know how many of them are actually registered in live. Um, but what, uh, what are some of the, uh, you mentioned use in commerce, so what are some of the trademark considerations that, uh, other trademark considerations that go along with emojis? Yeah, the trademark issue gets a messy really quickly because I would start with the premise that simply offering an emoji set to a 
a platform's user doesn't constitute a use in commerce. Mm -hmm. um, that it's not actually identifying the goods or services. It could possibly qualify as a trade dress, but then you'd have to get to things like secondary meaning and non-functionality here in the US. And you're gonna have some real challenges navigating that thicket yeah. if all that's been done is offer, depicted in the emoji set that's available for users to adopt. Um, so then we have to look, well, how else were these emojis used? And in what circumstance? And can we claim um, a, a trademark in that usage? Um, so it's almost like a diligence question. If you were trying to research that for a film, do we have a trademark issue should even worry about in the first instance? My view is that filmmakers shouldn't have to worry about depicting trademarks in their film, but unfortunately, case law is not always clear about that, uh, as I'm sure you, yep. you counsel your clients. So finding the actual emojis that are offered by platforms as trademarks, it's gonna take some work and m most of them won't qualify, just as kind of a math mm -hmm. issue. Um, however, the trademark database is filled with emoji-like depictions, and you'd have to, you know, go look for smileys of all different instances and look for how similar are those, and could they be argued to, to be in the same class of goods, and would there, that create a likelihood of consumer confusion about the source of the products? There's so much work that could be done on that front, and most people don't really even go that direction. They don't think about it, and so it's I view it as kind of an open field for what I think is going to be some trademark trolling in the future. People get the uh, trademark and emojis. They uh, then go and look for all usages of it, whether they're uh, trademark use mm -hmm. or not, and then they start making demands. Um, I, I could see where that's going to become a, a, a real consideration we all have to worry about. You mentioned source, uh, I believe it says source confusion. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that I, th I immediately pops to mind is that you know emojis, especially if they're not using trademark terminology, distinctive you know, from, you know, generic emojis. And then if you if you try to make an application for say like uh, emojis on, on hats or something like that, then because just the generic nature of it, then, or that there are so many other uses of that emoji out there for wh whatever uh, reason, um, whether it qual qualifies as in-commerce use or not, then you, you can get a lot of source confusion because who, the, 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 the you know, on your, on your tie there, you, know, the, you should describe you know. to your listeners that in addition <laughs> to join, join the beautiful weather, I'm fully decked out for pool wear wearing an emoji depicting a uh, tie with emoji depictions on it. That's right. <laughs> and it's a fantastic tie and very apt for, for your talk today, Eric. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, my, my, uh, my immediate thoughts go to is like, there, you know, there's a lot of source confusion problems with you know, using it emojis like uh, especially not not very distinctive ones or uh, as uh, as trademarks so super complicated area you can yeah. see how the issues start to spiral out of control mm -hmm. um, use the term generic now the fact that there might be many depictions of an emoji doesn't make it inherently generic That's or right. it doesn't do cause to be generic yeah. um, but there there at least was one case from Europe that held that an emoticon mm -hmm. was generic and therefore dropped out of the protection categorically as right. we know many other types of things that are are widely used and widely recognized can still become protectable as trademarks when they're identified with a particular uh, good or service in the marketplace and somebody builds enough goodwill in that to be recognized as a trademark. So um, it's certainly possible that someone can have a trademark in a what you might otherwise call in the late term generic smiley. Yeah. It just looked like a smiley. That's still a potential trademark. And because of that, then you're absolutely right. Now what do you do? How do you navigate with the fact that there's going to be potentially thousands of of depictions yep. are all in that uh, that category. Um, are they all segregated by class? Are they all overlapping? Are they all, no are they all knock each other out? That's right. Well, and I apologize, I used the wrong term. It's uh, in incapable, at least the Canadian terminology, incapable of being if it's distinguishing um, the, the source of the goods and services. Uh, well, here well, in the yeah, U.S., yeah. we would call yeah. it generic. Generic okay. would be the right terminology for it, um, okay. and uh, and it would have that consequence. If it's uh, generic, it can never become a trademark in that class of goods. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. One other uh, thing I want to talk about about emojis itself, and it was just uh, I, I read your blog post about the Israeli small claims court. Mm -hmm. And this is not about IP, but it was just super interesting because there's actually a, a, a decision regarding a landlord-tenant dispute. Mm -hmm. And can you can you just just in small Cole's notes just describe what what that dispute was about and the and the decision and the why it's why it's interesting if not significant. 
So uh, a landlord advertises an apartment uh, available for rent. Um, prospective tenant uh, sent a text message over saying, I'm really interested in the apartment, just need to work out the details. And as part of that, uh, there were uh, some emojis in that text message. Um, in particular, a string of six emojis that are somewhat confusing mm -hmm. to all of us. And we'll talk about that if you want. Uh, the, um, the question became, did the text message from the prospective tenant give the landlord enough reason to hold the apartment off the market um, and not uh, rent it to anyone else and therefore be entitled to damages for uh, having held off the market. In the United States, this case would have lost. Um, yeah. I'm guessing in Canada, it probably would have lost as well. I, I agree. I, I read your uh, the, the blog post, and yeah, it's, it's just a whole formation of contract, meeting of the there minds. Was, there was and, no yeah. formation contract. Um, and we don't have, there, there was not enough there to create some kind of promissory estoppel or other kind of mm -hmm. reason for the landlord to rely upon the tenant's representations, um, just based on that text message. Now, there were some other ch chatter, but still, it's not clear to me that the US courts would have recognized it. Uh, but in Israel, they have effectively a bad faith negotiation uh, law, right. um, and the court held that the um, the landlord was justified in holding off the uh, the renting of the apartment because of this bad faith negotiation. In a sense, that's a small claims court. The court was just trying to do justice. Um, that's right. It was about twenty two hundred dollars of damages U.S., um, so it wasn't a huge amount of money, um, and so it wasn't litigated the way that we would expect to be litigated in the kind of cases that you probably work on. But uh, but it was so interesting because of the fact that the emojis really did a lot of the work in that case. It wasn't just the text messages or the text in the messages that signaled the, the tenant's enthusiasm. It was the emojis that the court pointed to as saying, these are reinforcing the signal of enthusiasm and therefore we're going to hold the entire message as being the justifiable basis for landlord to withhold uh, or to not rent the, mark, uh, rent the uh, apartment. Right. It's uh, yeah, and I'll I'll put that uh, a link to that post in the show notes. It's a, it's a super interesting read, and um, it and, and interesting enough in, in Canada there was a recent I think it was a Supreme Court of Canada decision um, about uh, where there there is a I'm not sure how it would apply in this situation, but a duty to negotiate in good faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So or at least a, a, a duty to not negotiate in bad faith. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly what the wording is, but it'd be interesting to see how that would apply again to to a, a situation like this, if the outcome would be the same or not. I Again, the interesting question would yeah. be, could the emojis help tip the balance? You know, yeah. how do you imagine, yeah. how do you prove that someone negotiated in bad faith? Mm -hmm. Well, you look at everything, right? And you look yeah. at the words that were said, what words could have been said but weren't, and then you look at the, the metadata, like how long was the, were the parties taking to reach each other? And then you got these, these symbols in there as well. What are the symbols doing as part of this? What What is the reasonable sender saying? What's the reasonable recipient seeing? Mm -hmm. And this case raised all those issues, but because it's small claims court, it didn't really answer them definitively. Yeah. And so um, it's not the, the, the final word on the matter, but it is one of the best cases we have that really show how emojis can potentially skew the outcomes. Um, that's basically what the court said it did. And you had a comment in that blog post about, uh, I, I don't think the court actually looked at what the receiver was receiving in terms of the depiction of the emoji and what the sender was actually sending you know that that, that problem with you know the different platforms and you, 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 like I sent you in the email uh, we exchanged I sent you a, a watch well, mm -hmm. one, how did it look like uh, it, it looked like a watch. It I got like your a watch? message. Okay, yeah, all right, right. Was, uh, you were sending it as a substitute for the word time. Time. I, that's I got right. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that, that's that's one of the the issues as well. Is that, that, well, at least it didn't come out in the uh, maybe not in the decision whether or not they analyzed like what was the receiver seeing and what was the sender actually sending. So, so I got a secret for you and your listeners. Um, okay. I'm going to be in Israel in December and I'm actually going to uh, meet with the prospective tenant. I've connected with him <laughs> online. Uh, I've told him I'm coming and I'm going to actually do something similar to what we got set up here. I'll do an interview with him and I can ask him that question. It is possible that the tenant and the landlord were both using the same platform, yes. in which case there wouldn't have been a problem. And a more litigated case on a small claims court, you, that very issue very well yes. could have come up. It didn't come up. But again, that's not surprising given the small claims nature of the right. suit. Okay, well, let's uh, let's wrap it up then uh, with a question about, you know, with a, as a technology lawyer, what are some of the exciting technology trends you see in, in the law? Uh, well, I'm going to limit just to emojis because I'm super excited <laughs> about them. Um, the, the first thing is the move towards personalized emojis, uh -huh. uh, things like the Memoji or the Animoji or the AR emojis, where 
um, they're basically short videos um, that are capturing some of the movements or facial expressions of the user, but then representing them as a, as a, an emoji type depiction. So today in my talk, I'll show the the uh, the version that came out from Apple where they did showed what the image looked like, and they got a woman who's dancing and singing along, and she's using a fox head, and that fox head yeah. is uh, replicating all the facial expressions and head movements that yeah. she's got. If we call those emojis, which maybe we shouldn't, maybe we should call them something else, but if we're going to call them emojis, then um, emoji law gets so much more complicated mm -hmm. because now you've got how are you going to be able to capture that evidence? What will be the integrity of it over time? Will you be able to read it and see it like it was depicted at the time when the litigation is taking place possibly years later? And uh, so uh, as a uh, digital artifact, I think that the personalized emojis raise a whole bunch of issues that get even more more complicated mm -hmm. than the emoji uh, issues that we've got. One of the other issues that I see as a frontier for emojis um, is their searchability. Um, how do we actually find them? If you're doing new okay. discovery, if you're looking for them in cases, if you are um, looking for them in law review articles. Um, and I just posted recently on a, a law review article that tried to show how the different online services handled emojis and emoticons. Um, and some of them did okay, but none of them did perfectly. And some of them did terribly. So. Mm -hmm. um, uh, similarly, when you're doing your e-discovery, think about how is the e-discovery database handling the emojis that are embedded yeah. in uh, the messages? Are they searchable? Uh, will they be properly replicated? Uh, and w if you transfer them over, are you going to transfer over what you saw or what the person's uh, platform will That's substitute right. in? Um, so there's some forensic issue issues that are going to be created when you're dealing with e-discovery um, that I just want people to have, to have gotten to, um, but they're coming. And, uh, and I think they're going to be pretty interesting um, for, uh, for emoji users. Um, and otherwise, the, the, the biggest question for me about emojis is when are we going to get over this, this immaterial differences in platforms depictions? That doesn't really serve anybody. Mm -hmm. It's not in anyone's interest. Um, and yet it, it hasn't gone away. It's gotten a little better, but it's not, it's not really there yet. And I don't know what it would take. And so I'm very interested in thinking, can we build some kind of cross-licensing scheme or some other type of right. mechanisms that would enable uh, the... Uh, the platforms to fix this problem so that either the sender is seeing what, what the recipient's going to get or the recipient seeing what the sender said or something that makes sure that people aren't uh, miscommunicating. Wow, now that is fascinating. And it's a very, it's a, it's a fast moving area because these things are changing like constantly. Uh, new tech, like the technology is developing and, and the law is always lagging to keep up, right? So it, uh, that, that's, uh, that's amazing. Um, any, um, anything you want to plug or anything like that on the podcast? Uh, book or anything like that? Well, I'm going to plug uh, the Clio Cloud Conference uh, for okay. having gotten both of us together as well as putting us in this very beautiful setting. Right now, listeners are getting a light breeze off the ocean, and uh, uh, it's, it, is, it is a wonderful place to be. Uh, but otherwise, um, I am tracking all developments in emoji law, uh, both um, the law side. Um, I have alerts set up to let me know every time a new case comes out referencing emojis, um, but also in the social science side, because there's some really interesting work being done on the social science side to figure out what emojis are um, and how, how users are experiencing them. So, uh, so I do encourage you to come to my blog, uh, blog.ericolman.org, um, if you're interested in keeping up with the latest emojis. All right, perfect. So, so blog uh, is blog.ericgoldman.org. That's correct. Yeah, and where else uh, are you on the social webs or anything like that? Uh, yeah, so I'm active on all of them, but uh, Twitter is the place that might be the best home, uh, and it's Eric Goldman, all one word. Perfect, at Eric Goldman. Okay, Eric. Thank you very much for this, especially on short notice. I really appreciate your input and taking the time, uh, essentially right before your, your, your talk. Um, and I, I think you, you provide some very valuable content uh, for our listeners of Legal Cut Pro uh, with respect to emojis and, and uh, emojis in, in filmmaking. So thank you again. Yeah, my pleasure. Glad yeah. to have a chance to chat with you. Take care. Legal Cut Pro has been produced by Greg Pang and Michelle Molyneux. Excerpts of Just Say Go, Dr. Octavo, Mendicity, mixed courtesy of Dr. Octavo and Michelle Molyneux. This podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only. Nothing stated on it is to be construed as legal advice. The views expressed by the hosts of Legal Cut Pro and any guests are their own and do not represent the opinions of any organization or other person unless otherwise stated. Intro sound clip film projector countdown has been truncated from its original form and is copyright 2013 Ivan Gabovich used under creative 
Creative Commons BY3 license. Outro sound clip film projector reel runs out by Stefan021 is used under Creative Commons CC01.0 license. This podcast is copyright of Red Frame Law and is licensed to you under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial CC BYNC 4.0 license. For details of that license, visit creativecommons.org.